I'm Lance Butters. Um, I'm part of BC801. Um, we're the hacker space up in Salt Lake. Um, we focus a lot on um, uh, information security, mostly focusing on kind of the offensive side of things. Um, today, so today my goal is not to, I'm not going to be talking a lot about how to do things, but a lot more about kind of general overview and where you can get more information. So, um, if you have any specific questions, just let me know, or if you want to go over something or something's not clear, just uh, raise your hand and we can uh, talk about it. Um, this is our website at dc801.org. <coughs> This, is the, this one is my website, uh, that's where I'll post my slides. And then if you want to get a hold of me throughout the day, I'm on uh, Fremont IRC and it's in town DC801, just channel. <coughs> um, before I get started, I just want to put a disclaimer. Like, I'm going to be talking a lot about um, dangerous topics. You can get in legal trouble. Um, and I don't, I'm not here to condone, like, hey, let's hack a bunch of stuff, let's cause a lot of damage, let's destroy something. Because the goal isn't really to destroy something, it's to kind of show, you know, show that these things are possible and they do exist and show the potential damage of what hacking and offensive security and, um, you know, not ignoring the problem is, uh, is not good. But... You know, we're, we're going to be doing attacks. We, we're going to cause, you know, we have the potential of this information to do damage to systems. So we don't want to do that against systems that we don't own, we're not authorized to attack, and because we might have to face legal consequences if we do. So um, my disclaimer is pretty much, uh, I'm not responsible if you use this information in any way to cause any damage to any other systems or property. Um, if you have legal questions, please consult the lawyer. I am not one. Um, so this is kind of my take on security. Um, these are the realms that I kind of see uh, the information technology. This is kind of the different areas. So when you talk about security, you usually, and with information technology, um, you're usually working within the system administration realm the software engineering realm or the network engineering realm. So these three things are critical, in my opinion, to any network, to any uh, information system, right? Like if you don't have a network, there's no point in having a web application. If you don't have an operating system, well, your web application won't run. So you need all these three things to provide web services, to provide connectivity, to provide data. Um, you know, back in the old days, before the internet, you know, you just had the operating system and your software, and you're, you, and you're just mainly working with users that would connect and use your software, you know, locally. Now, we, you know, take our software, we put it on the internet, and we expose it to the world. So everyone has access to our software, they have access to our operating systems, and they have access to our network. And security is about limiting that access and providing a secure way so that we can provide these services to people and not have to worry about, um, you know, potential damages that can uh, happen when we when we have, you know, a world looking at our our, uh, our at our applications and our infrastructure. Um, so most. Security professionals usually come up from one of these realms. Um, it's very helpful uh, when you're start when you're looking to start a security career. Um, it's helpful to have some um, system administration, to have some programming, to have some networking. Because they because when you're when you're uh, doing attacks, you're going to be leveraging pretty much all three things. So you're going to need you know. It's really useful to know how networking works. It's really useful to know how the operating system works. It's also really useful to kind of understand how um, the software works. And having kind of a broad experience can be very helpful in um, doing your doing your attacks and uh, doing um, showing you know looking through uh, code and doing your attacks. And um, I forget. A little nervous. I'm yeah, question. When it comes to, say, 
basically an intro to having the website. So we're starting out, no matter what language you learn, you're based on Metasploit and stuff, Python, anything make any difference? Um, I'll talk about that a little later. Like the, the, the good place to start is kind of the Metasploitable. Um, the, the, with Metasploit and the Metasploitable um, uh, VM. So they're, uh, the Offensive Security publishes, they have a website, it's um, called Metasploitable. They kind of go through, they have really good documentation, they go through kind of like how to use Metasploit, um, how to, you know, run exploits, how to do things like that. Um, that's a good, that's a really good place to start. Um, that's kind of where I kind of point people. Um, if you want to learn, like you, you know, if you want to learn like a programming language, Python's really good because a lot of security scripts are written in Python. Um, Metasploit's written in Ruby, so if you want to write um, modules and exploits for Metasploit, it's good to learn Ruby. So those are the two I kind of recommend just getting familiar with. You don't need to be an expert in it, but it helps to kind of just be familiar with the language. You're really good enough to have to code. Yeah, because. Like like with the with the heart bleed, they published a Python script, you know, that to say, hey, you can test it. Well, you just don't want to download the script and run it because it had um, it had some binary in it, you know, it had some hexadecimal, it had some you know other stuff in it, and you gotta be like, well, am, am I running an exploit against my system? Is this executable code? So you kind of gotta go through the the script and understand. You just don't want to take this script and run it because you might be doing more damage than good. So. It helps to kind of be able to know the code enough when you when you're getting scripts and doing other things and getting it from trust you know get get it from a trusted source so you can understand um, what's going on. And I mean it's not it's not there's a lot of stigma about this about you know being oh you have to be really good lead hacker. It's not a lot of security is not about um, knowing very you know obscure crazy detail. It's about, um, mainly it's just about doing configurations correctly and testing systems. Hackers are really just really good testers, if you look at it that way. They're just really as expert testers because they, they go through, they look for problems with systems, and then they're, they find problems. They say, look, look, look at this problem I found. I wonder how far I can take this problem. So that's kind of how the, you know, the first buffer overflows work. There was a time where they were, you know, buffer overflow exploits were considered theoretical because they're like, well, we think we can get code execution on the system, but we're not 100% sure. And then finally, someone, you know, figured it out, got it running, and you know, provided evidence. Like I, you know, because of this software flaw, because of this problem, I was actually able to take control of the system and do damage. So if you think about it, hacking is really just extensive, persistent testing. And everybody loves testers, right? <laughs> so testers are just the worst, or hackers are just the worst testers. Is they, they, not only do they break your system, they steal all your data. So when you're hacking, you're gonna be doing, these are the three things you're gonna be doing. When someone says like they're hacking or they're doing attacks, you're gonna be doing one, it's gonna be one of these three categories. And these are my own personal categories. I just kind of, came up with when I was making this presentation. So you're either compromising a system, so you're, you're trying to get into a system, you're trying to gain control of it, you're trying to manipulate data, you're trying to do change. Um, you know, and that, that's, kind of, that's kind of what everybody wants to do. I mean, ideally, you know, that's awesome. If you get control, you get admin rights, you get control of the system, you get control of everything, and then you own it. You know, you can pretty much make changes, do whatever you want with the data. So if you can't if you can't get control of the data, the second best thing is to you know steal the data, see what data leakage you can get. So another big part of hacking and here you're seeing what information. I mean, maybe I can't get control of the system, but what information can I pull out of the system? So you you want to you know kind of think of these. These are the three things you're going to be doing. So and then and the final thing is just kind of you throw your hands up in the air denial of service. This is pretty much like at the point where I can't get into anything, I can't do anything, I can't get any data, so you know I'm going to take my ball and go home and I'm going to prevent people from accessing the website, accessing the services, because I mean that's damaging, right? If you're, if, I mean, you know, how many people here can be down for a day? You know, if, you're, if your service or your 
software isn't working for a day, that's a whole day your customers can't use your product. That's bad, right? So if, you know, as an attacker, if I can get your system, I can find ways to make your system slow. You know, so basically I'm just testing it, right? I mean, you know, you guys test your software, you're looking for problems, you're like, oh, this part of the code's really slow. Well, if I execute that piece of code 300 times, 10,000 times, 100,000 times, and I spawn a lot of processes, and it's really fast for me to get that code to execute, I can make your system go to a crawl, and then now your users can't use your, your product. So, you know, you just think about hacking is mostly just really advanced testing. That's kind of key. So these are kind of um, the realms of computer security. So these are kind of like what I call the attack surfaces. Um, these are kind of the areas of attack. Um, when I kind of think about, when you're thinking about how, how someone would get into your system or how, um, you know, how you're, how you're vulnerable. And the biggest vulnerability is users. And then the second one, I think, in my opinion, is hardware. It's really easy. Social engineering is the easiest way to get access to a computer system. Because you show up, you, you know, you put on a nice shirt, and you say, hi, I'm Lance from IT. You've never been to the company. No one knows who you are. You know, it's like, hey, I just started today. I need admin. I need the admin password so I can do my job. A lot of people want to be helpful. You know, I mean, you know, if, if you didn't really know, a lot of people don't, you know. They just want to be helpful. They just want to... You know, like, oh, it's a new person. You're know, like, oh, I want to get this. You know, I want to help this person out. And they're like, oh, here's the admin password to the domain controller or the Linux server or whatever. And then you know, you're in. The easiest way to get into a system is pretty much ask. A lot of times, people will give you information. The second easiest is through hardware. Now, I'm talking like physical electronics because how many how many of you kind of looked at your electronics? How many times have you opened your computer and looked to see if there's any you know, USB, mysterious USB devices, or, you know, if there's something in your keyboard that um, is, you know, leaking information. You know, maybe, you know, maybe once you said you, you've done it a couple times. Okay, good, that's good. Yeah. So, there, I, I was told a story, there was a group of pen testers, and they couldn't get, you know, so a pen tester, probably explain their, their, their job is to find problems and to hack systems and, you know, basically get in and get the crown jewels and show, hey, how this is how we get it. So there was a group of pen testers and they were authorized to do social engineering. They're, they're, you know, they're given pretty much the full gambit. And when you're doing pen testing, you want to get good documentation and you want to get good contracts and the, make sure they're spelled out because if you, if you don't, you can face real serious uh, legal action because you can, you know, you're, you're doing malicious things, so you can uh, end up breaking stuff. You know, and so you want to be very careful when you're doing this. You know, when you're testing stuff, and the best place to test stuff is test your own stuff at your house by yourself. So if it goes down and breaks and everything, you know, goes to garbage, you can, you know, you can walk away and be like, oh well. But anyway, so back to my story. So there's a group of pen testers. They're trying so hard to get into this you know, system because they, they can't, you know, the network security is really good, the software security is really good, and then the users are really good. They can't get any, you know, the users have been trained really well. They're having a really hard time getting access and then system stuff. And so what they did is they bought really expensive, nice keyboards. And then they put they put a device in the keyboard which would capture you know any keystrokes and then it would send out a wireless signal outside the building and they you know they, they took it apart and they put this in and they packaged it back up and they mailed it to the system admins and say congratulations you won you know this prize from this contest here's this super awesome keyboard and every single system you know they bought one for every system admin and they all like, oh, this is awesome. They all unplugged it, you know, unwrapped it, plugged it in, and it started working. They got all the passwords, got all the information, you know, and they, they were in. So, you know, that's a combination of, you know, users and the hardware. But, you know, a lot of people overlook the hardware. I mean, networking, 
Networking is kind of like the one everyone is uh, very excited about because you know you, you have your web server or you have you have the socket that's open to the public. If I can compromise your network, if I can even compromise your service, I don't really have to interact with you. And I, you know I'm kind of mysteriously you know not not interacting with you. I'm interacting with your network, and so it, it's it's kind of uh, I don't know. I thought this is kind of like the front door. You know, for, for attacking, and then once you know you try to get the network socket, you try to attack the services. Then maybe you go after the software, and if you can't get anything to the software, you go after the users. Maybe try some hardware stuff. You know, hardware hacks. Maybe get some USB um, listener or things like that. So this kind of leads to: Can you trust your computer? I mean, who here trusts their computer? Yeah, I mean, we, we trust it pretty much, but I mean, who here has read every line of source code on your operating system? Who here understands every circuit on your motherboard and what it does, right? So you're putting a lot of faith in a lot of teams of engineers and a lot of manufacturers and a lot of, of people that have come together to build the product that you're using and you're entering information in this product and you're giving trust to it in the hopes that it's not leaking information, right? And for the most part, people are pretty honest. I mean, you know, no one wants to sell a product that's got malware on it. No one wants to, you know, really, well, some people do, but for the most part, you know, good companies don't want to do that. But I mean, you know, the, the Army kind of has a problem with this because if you get chips manufactured from China, and like, you know, if we went to war with China, well, we, all of our, you know, equipment and all of our infrastructure is made from chips manufactured there, so can you really trust it, you know? I mean, not that we, you know, not that we ever go to war, but, I mean, that's just kind of an example, is like, we, we, we live in a world economy, and we source all of these parts, and then just one of these links fail, you know, you've got a problem. Someone can get access to your system, you get access to your hardware, Things like that. And this is kind of the mentality you kind of got to think about. So what what you're going to do as a security person is you're going to look um, for data leakage. You're going to look for signs of problems, right? We can't read all the source code. We don't have time to understand all of the hardware, all of the infrastructure. We don't have time to. So what we're going to do is look for signs of problems. We're going to look for data leakage. And we want to we want to buy software. We want to buy hardware from trusted, reputable places. I mean, it just depends on you know your your need. If you have a highly secure system and you need to be you know be running during a, a you know a disaster or something, or you know maybe a nuclear war, it might not be good to buy parts internationally. You might want to manufacture your hardware and um, software and everything internally, so you just have control over it. But you know, in this day and age, and you know, we don't have um, the, the time and the resources to re-engineer everything. So we just got to buy and use software from trusted, reliable sources, and then we're going to test software for bugs and crashes, and look, you know, do network forensics. How many people have run Wireshark here? Good. So what what does Wireshark do? Packet snipper. Yeah, it's a packet snipper. Snipper. So if, if I have um, hardware, like, so let's say I'm some manufacturer in China and I want to collect credit card data, I'm going to sell this part really cheap and I'm going to make my cost up and just stealing data, maybe just stealing information and reselling it. Well, one way I'm going to collect that information is through your networking interface, right? So you can fire up Wireshark and you look at the traffic and you say, oh, Looks like maybe my heart there might be a problem with my hardware because it's talking to China all day. I reinstalled the operating system, you know, I wiped it, I, I believe I have good code. I've run this code on other systems, you know, you know, looking for problems, and every time I, I boot up the server or I boot up this um, piece of software or whatever you're testing and you move it, you know, you want to change and test it different places, I'm noticing that my traffic is going out somewhere, right? That's the problem. So a lot of security is just looking for the potential of data leakage and other kinds of problems. 
All right. So, how many of how many of you here have heard of a CVE? Good. So, a CVE is a common vulnerability and exposure. It's basically kind of a database of, of vulnerabilities and problems that people come across on um, software and, and operating systems and hardware. And it's a good place, and I've got links here. Um, so look, you can go in there and look for the certain types of software you're running. You know, you look at the version numbers and see if there's any known vulnerabilities. All right, now for the hacking. So everyone put on your ski mask because we can't do hacking without a ski mask, right? <laughs> yeah, seriously, we need to have one. Because you don't want the computer to know who you are, right? I, I never understood this, why this, like, that's got to be so uncomfortable wearing a ski mask all the time while you're typing. Yeah, just put a piece of tape over your webcam and you should be fine. You don't need a ski mask. Okay, so um, here, who knows what a vulnerability is? What is it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, vulnerability is a weakness in an application that allows uh, something to occur that was not initially intended. Yes. Basically, it's a problem, right? It's a, a vulnerability is a potential for problems. Basically, you found a bug. Vulnerabilities can be bugs. They can be, um, you know, code that's ex you know running a long time or you know causing the system to crash. Um, exploits are the way you take advantage of vulnerabilities. So if you have an exploit, you say there is a way for me to use this vulnerability, use this problem. So I found this bug, right? I found this problem, and I'm going to take what I know and then try and do something with it. So this is like we have a problem and now we're going to do something with it. And so exploits are about, um, so we have a problem and we have the exploits. So exploits are how we get onto the system. So if we're going to compromise the system, the exploit is the way. So it can be a piece of code, it can be a technique, it can be a lot of different things, but it's how we're going to get the operating system or how we're going to convince the processor to execute code or we're going to do something. And then payloads are what you do after you've exploited the system. So once I've gotten control of the processor and I've convinced it, hey, run this code for me, right? That's what the exploit does. It's just how do I get this processor, and an example of a buffer overflow, how do I get this processor to run code for me. And this is this is can be code, like I said, or a technique. So basically, when someone was talking about a buffer overflow exploit, they're saying this is how I got the processor, how I got past all the security mechanisms and got the system to actually run my code, right? And then the payload is like, okay, so I can get the processor to run code, but you know, that that's cool, but now I want to do something. I want to have access to the system. I want to you know, have the system do something for me and see what I can what I can do. So you could this would be where you put like your, your back door, your binaries, or your callbacks. And so this these three things are critical. There, you have a yeah, and shell code and payload the same thing. Um yeah, shell code and payload mm -hmm. and at times they can be the same thing. A shell code is 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 more specific to um, kind of exploiting operating systems, but your payload can be, you know, if your goal, it depends on your goal, so payload's more broad, shell code's more specific to, like, oh, I'm attacking this operating system, I want to run this piece of code. Okay. So this, this, this is really important. Does anyone have any questions about this? Is it, it when I first got started with um, computer security, I didn't really understand this very well. And, and once I did, it just everything just kind of clicked in place. So you know, we're running an exploit. We're taking advantage of a problem. We're we're going to do something that's going to give us um, additional admin rights, or you know, give us additional access. And then once we do have that additional access, we're going to do something with that access, or we're going to like you have to do a recon. You have to figure out what the problem is. Which is 
find the problem, and you figure out how to get through the door, and once you're through the door, then you drop the bomb. Yeah. Good example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like we talked about, shell code, um, piece of code that, that we run that will call back to our system or give us control or give us further access and kind of let us do something. Um, so kind of the prerequisite, and this is for like writing exploits maybe for networks. So anytime you have data in to a piece of software, you have the potential to exploit something. So you know if, you have, if you're opening up a file, if you have a socket that's taking data in, or you're um, you know, processing any piece of data, you're, you have the potential to run an exploit. There's a potential for a problem. So for writing exploits, this is kind of what, this is, this is more advanced stuff, but this is kind of what you need to understand to write exploits. This is not what you need to understand to use exploits. So Metasploit has a bunch of exploits that are already um, set up and done for you, and they make it really simple. You just set the variables, you point it at the right place, and then you, you type exploit, and it'll send out the packets and run, you know, send out the execution code and run um, the payloads. But if you're interested in writing exploits and understanding shellcode, that's kind of the things you need to understand is the, you know, uh, some C programming is good, has some understanding of assembly and understanding um, CPU architectures because what you're really doing like of a buffer overflow is you're, you're manipulating the way that the CPU processes data. So you're working with the CPU, and they have um, security measures in place, but the, the biggest problem that we have is that we have uh, code and we have data living in the same area. So we have instruction sets and we have data sets, and so if I can get my, my data that I'm feeding into the processor to bleed over into the instruction sets, I can get the system to do something. Does that make sense? You don't need to go that far. You just need to overwrite the return address. Yeah. But you have to you have to get your 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 shell code into the memory you know, memory space, and you have to you know overwrite the return address and have it you know go into the shell code. But you know that's more advanced topic. So these are the kind of the types of uh, exploits. So you have stack overflow, heap corruption, format string attacks, integer bugs, raise conditions, uh, TCP IP protocol manipulations. These are just kind of the ways you can attack systems. I've provided more information there so you can um, take a look at that. Um, if you're interested in doing exploit development, there's, uh, there's some good exercises here. There's some VMs and some uh, uh, tutorials, so they kind of walk you through. Okay, this is how you manipulate the memory. This is how you, you know, overwrite the return address. Do things like that, and then a good place to start is Kali Linux because Kali is um, so Kali is a replacement of um, Backtrack. It's more of an enterprise, and it's, it's um, developed by Offensive Security, and then they do the Metasploit training. And here's the kind of the link to Metasploit Unleashed. This has got a lot of good stuff in here. If you want to really get good at this, go through all of this, because this will get you very familiar with um, Metasploit. So another, so another type of uh, attack is privilege, privilege escalation. So once you kind of have access to systems, so like let's say you're attacking um, HTTP, it's a web server. It's usually running as either Apache or doesn't have that data. It's running as a user with less you know, permissions. So um, what you want to do is, um, and this is a link to kind of a good explanation of privilege escalation. So if you do get access to a system or you do get you know access to a shell or can run commands or do something, you're going to eventually, you know, like, well, it'd be nice if I could have full control, not just a restricted user. So this is kind of like getting sudo without having the password, right? Or getting admin access on a Windows box without having the password. 
Um, another type of attack um, is passive attacking. So you're just basically eavesdropping. Um, so basically, you, you know, you can run SSL strip. Um, you know, get man in the middle, Wireshark, vSniff. These tools are kind of these tools are really really old, but they still work. Um, DSNF is just kind of like the whole package library of uh, layer one and two attacks. So it's got like art poisoning. Um, you can do uh, me uh, yeah art poisoning. You can do just general sniffing with it. Um, another good tool is EdgarCap. Um, I think they used to be part of this, but I think it branched or something like that. Maybe it's different. But SSL strips a good tool. It's um, created by um, Oxymoron Spike. Uh, it'll let you um, basically, if you have the private key for SSL traffic, you can pretty much strip all the SSL traffic off and just look at the plain um, plain. <coughs> it's also a really good debugging tool. So if you have, you know, if you have a secure application and you you know you need to look at the SSL traffic outside of your environment kind of see what it looks like to customers who need the SSL strip. And then we talked about denial of service, but we'll go over it a little bit again. Um, it's just basically we're doing volume-based attacks, we're doing protocol attacks. We're basically our goal is to prevent people to create so much traffic, to create so much usage, so that we're preventing people from accessing services or doing something. And this is kind of like the last resort where um, you're just basically like, I can't do anything, so I'm just going to, you know, give them way too much load. And so you can do, you know, you do volume-based attacks, protocol attacks, application layer attacks, UDP floods, ICMP floods, SIM floods, there's the ping of death. You know, there's also zero-day um, DDoS stuff. So, you know, if there's problems, there's been problems with like NTP, DNS. So like you can do a DNS request um, to, to a DNS server and the DNS server will reflect it back. So you can send it, um, you know, you can do it for UDP, send it a false IP or your target IP address and the return address and you keep sending to it and it'll just send a huge amount of data to this other, to this IP address. So the server has to keep processing this huge amount of packets that keep coming through. I don't know, and I'm not going to explain that very well. This is, you know, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm trying to do a broad spectrum and just kind of get you guys familiar with what, what's possible out there. Does anyone have any questions about DDoS? Okay. Um, so these are kind of some DDoS tools. So there's little ion, little over ion cannon. Um, th this was released a while ago. A lot of this stuff is kind of... Uh, Kind of old. Another good resource is the OWASP DOS issue pose. You can go. OWASP is a good website to go to for just general um, uh, web application hacking and just security information. It's got a lot of good training and information on how to secure websites and things like that. But these are kind of different tools. So you can take, you can download a low iron cat, low orbit iron cannon and go kind of go learn the tool, go through it and run it against, you know, maybe your private web server and see how your <coughs> web server is responding to it. You should be able, most of all the attacks in here and all the, the tools should be able to defend against. Um, they're, they're pretty well known. So um, the concept of man in the middle, who, who knows what man in the middle is? Basically, uh, you're, you're you're communicating, or someone's communicating with some service, and you're sitting in the middle, getting, either impersonating or catching the information. Yeah, so man in the middle is where, so you know, um, you're having a secure conversation with your customer. So like, I, like I'm a customer of a bank. I log into the bank, I get an SSL cert, you know, we go through all the encryption process. And so I'm, I'm, I'm think, I'm hoping, and I'm, you know, that um, my communication is encrypted. Well, there, there's signs of uh, man in the middle attack. So, like, if the cert, how many have you seen the cert errors? You know, that say this, this site isn't protected, right? So if you go to your bank and you're saying there's a problem with the SSL cert, someone might be doing a man in the middle attack against you, right? Because maybe they've convinced your traffic to go to their server first. 
and then they're going to redirect their, their, their traffic, your traffic, back to the bank, and the bank's going to send it back to them, and he's going to send it back to you. So if, your cert, if you have a problem with your cert, and um, you're not seeing, you know, that, that person can decrypt your traffic, send it back, and it looks, and if you accept that person's cert, I'm not doing a good job on this. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying, I, SSL is really complicated, the whole process that works, but the basic concept is that if, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you see a problem with your cert, there's a potential that someone might be in between you, your communication with your bank and your traffic and they can decrypt it. And so a layer two attack tool is EdgarCap. Um, you can use that to, to kind of get man in the middle and do different things. Um, there's a good presentation here from Black Hat that kind of explains the different types of attacks. So you can do man in the middle on SSH, HTTPS, and IPsec. Um, so there's a good resource for you guys. So social engineering. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Social engineering is a way of getting people to divulge information. Um, and kind of, so it's, it's just kind of a way, you know, you go on, you ask it, you, you impersonate um, IT people, you impersonate, you know, you look like you're in charge. So the, the key defense against social engineering is user training, like, you know, ask why do you need these access and get approval. You know, so if someone comes in that you've never seen before and you don't know, you, you, you call someone and say, hey, I've got this guy here, is he supposed to be here doing this stuff, right? You want to verify that if someone's in your environment and in your area and you don't know who they are, you don't know if they're authorized to access it, you want to be able to, um, you don't want to just give them information and, and let them into the system. Um, there's a kind of a toolkit for doing social engineering, kind of web attacks. The social engineering toolkit is also installed um, by default in Kali. Um, this, what this tool does is it lets you impersonate websites. So we talked about the man in the middle. So I can use the social engineering toolkit to copy Facebook, right, and, and, and impersonate their website. Now if I can convince you, I, you know, I, modif I can modify your host file and your operating system. I mean, there's a million different ways to do this, but if I can convince you that I'm Facebook, and I present you a Facebook page and you enter in your password, I can collect it using this tool, and then I just and then I just send you off to Facebook, right? And then you go do your Facebook off application, and I've got your password. Just and you can the thing is, is you can do things. You can just set up a duplicate website, and a lot of times, and you can just even put it on someone's computer. And they won't even question. They'll just log into Facebook. You know, I mean, how many times do people really look at URLs? Things like that. Do you want to have any questions? I know it's early. <laughs> questions. We're all a little sluggish today. I appreciate you guys coming out on a Saturday. Um, the other days you're away from work, so you're happy. Yeah. This is like the number one thing that I always try to teach my mom mm -hmm. you know, to look out for. She's always the one person. Yeah. It, it, it's hard, you know, especially with um, kind of the older generation, because because there's a lot of things you gotta look at, look for. Because like if you if you connect if you go to www to like fce book, you know, missing the a, it's really easy to just look at the URL and like, oh, that's cool. Your your brain will transpose it and actually, you know, make it. You think that uh, that is Facebook. So you gotta be really careful, you know, when you're doing secure stuff. So you know, look at the URLs, look at what's going on, and kind of look for signs of attack. Um, so these are kind of the tools for web attacks. Um, there's the OAuth top 10. So this is like the top 10 vulnerabilities for websites. Uh, it talks about SQL injection um, and um, uh, you know, bad a bunch of bad practices. There's the uh, Zap tool, which is free and open source. Um, it's a pretty good tool. Burp is better, but it's not free. You, it, they do have, well, they have a free version, but if you want more advanced features, it's, it's a pay for product. But 
this is really good product um, for most of all of your, your general web application testing and, and uh, stuff. It's gonna do it's gonna do everything you need. Zap, I've been kind of playing with Zap just because I, I want to help out open source and I just like you know free tools. But Burp, Burp's a really good tool too. So. So um, for web attacks, there's the SQL injection. So what we're what we're doing with SQL injection is we're taking advantage of the fact that we're we're taking you know so we have code we have um, PHP code or any type of code that's taking a string and then sending it to a second language a SQL language and any time you have that you're going to have injection problems and so injection problems is you're manipulating the way that the code is interpreting the data. Um, and you can have problems with the SQL, with injection problems on OS. So like, how many people have written kind of like a web interface, they'll run like a ping command or do operating system commands? Yeah, so you have to be very careful when you do that to sanitize your input because if you run, if you take strings from a website and run it locally on an operating system, you have the potentials, like if I put semicolon or do something, that I can manipulate the command. So let's say I have ping. So I do ping in an IP address. Well, if I put a semicolon after that, then after, you know, the, the operating system interprets that as, oh, I'm done with this command, now run this other command. And so... Um, a little bit. Yeah. This is kind of one of the easier ways as a developer to sneak a backdoor into production. Yeah. Yeah, just provide an interface that uh, that allows you to execute commands, and then that then at that point you can convince the system to download stuff, run run commands, connect out, do all kinds of different stuff. Um, so then there's broken authentication and session management. So this is basically when um, uh, your your software doesn't you know you need to test your software, like we said. Hackers are just really, really, really good testers, and so if you're not, if you write, if you write a piece of management software like, oh well, this user, you know, you have to pay to get these extra features, and you're just, you know, doing very simple checking for it, you know, you're not going to, you don't test it, and you don't try to think about how, you know, how can someone attack the system, and that they can get through, and that's one of the big um, OWASP top tens. Just along that line, yeah. uh, there's like a I think uh, who's that, that guy that killed himself recently because like he found on the website on AT and T's website that oh I can just change my number and then yeah. I can look at someone else's record. Mm -hmm. People got pissed off at him. I don't remember his name, but I do remember reading that. So yeah, so they're they're like a vulnerability. So like in the URL, you know, have you ever seen like the ID equals one? Well, if you put in ID equals two, ID equals three, ID equals four, you know maybe you can get access to other people's um, information. So I, I guess in that case, like he he saw that his you know he logged into his AT and T account or, or whoever you know he logged into his account and saw oh well I'm a, I'm user ID five. So if I type in ID user twenty, do I actually get to see user 20's information? And yeah, if you know, if you see that information, then you definitely have a problem with your um, authentication and session. You know, you're, you have a broken system because you're not validating the input. There's a fair number of sites that do that too. Yeah, it's very common. Go for the easy hack before you go diving. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, another type of attack is uh, cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting is kind of like so if you have a blog, you know you have you have um, so you, your users are typing information and they're presenting that information to other users. So the, the classic case is a blog. So uh, you know maybe you have like a, a site. MySpace was vulnerable to this in the past, where you know you have that user stream, you have that news feed stream, or you know post. So you can take a bunch of JavaScript, enter it into the text input, and then click submit and then so when someone comes to view your, your comment or your post, 
you're actually, they're actually running the JavaScript. So that's what um, cross-site scripting is. It's basically you submit some type of JavaScript or some type of script and try to get the browser to run that script from the website. So you know, that's another point of you know, doing input validation where it can become very important. Um, Cross-site request, request forgery. So th what this is, is let's say you're logged into your bank account, right? So you're logged into your bank account and you know, you're, you're looking at your balance. Well, maybe you're gonna go to my blog site. Well, on my blog, I might have some JavaScript that I have you, you know, when you get to my blog and you download my uh, HTML, I have JavaScript because I know well that I like, I know that you probably use this type A bank. So I have code. I have type A bank. So I look at all the requests and information. And I find oh you know I can easily write some JavaScript that will you know move funds out of your bank your bank account into my bank account. So if you're logged into your bank and they're vulnerable to cross-site request forgery and you download my JavaScript, and I run those requests as you to that other site to say, hey, move this money into the other bank. This is from this bank account to my bank account. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So basically, it's just you're, you're doing requests. One site's doing requests for another site. This is really easy to protect against. You basically just need to, in your forms, you just need to put in a random, you know, random string so that it's different every time, and then have that user return that string to you when they do a request. Because usually, the you know the person doing the cross-site re request forgery isn't going to be able to get that information because they don't have they won't have access to it in the DOM. But they pro they do because you know this 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 attack kind of comes from the the invention of AJAX. So you know when you do AJAX, your your browser goes back and talks to the web server, you know, it gives you really good fun functionality, but when it's doing um, connections to other systems, okay, I don't have time. So, I mean, if you guys, if you guys are interested in this stuff, um, we do a lot of this stuff at the hackerspace too, so just come talk to me. Um, we, love, we love having people up there and love talking about this stuff. Um, there's password hashing, so basically you just take a, a string so this is kind of like a defense. So a lot of websites will, um, you know, for their authentication, they'll just take a, their the user password and they'll take it into an MD5 hash or a SHA-1 hash and then store it. It's better than clear text, but not much. Yeah, you, sometimes they can store it in clear text. They do store it in clear text, and that's really bad because you don't want your your data, you don't want your system administrators to know every single user's password and to log in with people, other people to have that information. But this is some good information on uh, password hashing. Um, group forcing is another type of attack. So basically what you're doing is you're just trying to, you know, so like you have a web interface that's got a web of login. You're just trying all kinds of different common, um, well, when you're brute forcing, you're just trying random data strings to see if you can eventually guess the password. Dictionary attack, you're sending a list of known common passwords and usernames to the system to see if you can kind of guess and get access. Um, Medusa is good for, uh, is a good tool for like connecting to websites. Um, John the Ripper is good for kind of cracking MD5 hashes and um, other types of um, password hashes. And then there's rainbow tables, so you can take, um, basically take the password hash Enter the rainbow table. If it's not salted, get the get the password back. Um, I wanted to add more more about reverse engineering. I'm going to add more to the slide later. But reverse engineering is basically you're just taking a piece of software. So let, let's say you get some malware and you want to know what it does. You're basically just looking at the instructions, looking at all the different information. Um, this Hooper and Ida are good tools for that Hooper. Is a new one on the market. A hopper is a hopper app. Um, I've been kind of playing with that a little bit. Um, it's kind of in competition with Ida. Ida's just been kind of dominated the market um, with reverse engineering. But um, Hooper's a good application to use. 
And so this is kind of my reference, and so this is where the, I got the background art. I asked the, the, guy, the guy who did it on his DeviantArm, I'm like, hey, this is a great background, can I use it in my presentation, and I'll put it in my slides. So I said, yep, here it is. So that's everything. Um, Sam, was it? I used to have a pretty good selection of sample bars and stuff for doing that. Mm -hmm. Is there any place that's good to go get that again for this at all? Um, I have to go. I have to go through my notes again. I do. I do have some places. I'll put, I'll put them on my slides. But uh, if you come up to the uh, hacker space at DC one, we've got a bunch of stuff too. So sorry for coming in late. Where can we find your slides? Um, they will be on my website. And I also point. I'll put them on joined in. Um, so you can find us at dc81.org. Um, this is kind of just my site um, where I post my stuff. So I'll have my slides on here, and I'll also point, uh, post my slides to uh, what is it joined or is not? Yeah, is it joined in? Or? Yeah.